بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جاءته سهلا وأنت تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته We welcome you all to this special post-Ramadan, post-Eid edition of the Black Imams Roundtable. I am Imam Amin Muhammad, the resident Imam of Masjid Muhammad in Atlantic City. I'm joined with my beloved Imam, Naeem Abdullah, the resident Imam of Masjid Mu'min in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And we don't have with us our third, who's definitely first in status, Imam Fahim Lee of the Kuba School and Islamic Center in Camden, New Jersey. But this is a very important special Imam, Black Imams Roundtable, that we have some important, important legal rulings that we need to explain to our audience. But since we have to do that, we also wanted to talk about and have reflections about Ramadan and Eid which we all went through and update you because we didn't have a round table during the whole month of Ramadan because we were all so engaged. So please, 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 this is an extremely important session that we need as many people to hear it and to learn the rule that we're going to mention And it's a general rule that needs to be spread, especially in the light of some recent legal rulings that were issued that many people would be deluded by, even with a good intention. So we want to address that. We'll address that a little later. But we wanted to uh, first just have some Ramadan and Eid reflections. And the title of this special edition is Ramadan and Eid Reflections, Substance Over Appearance. And it's extremely important, as I mentioned a lot, on the Black Imam's Roundtable, on Masjid Muhammad's own morning reflections and scattered thoughts and post fudge reflections and different lessons, that we got to have substance over appearance. In other words, we have to be Muslim, be Mu'min, right? And I had some discussions during the Eid and prior to the Eid, and even during Ramadan, at our discussions between the Taraweeh prayer, we would have a session after 10 Raqqa, we would have a talk. And during these talks, we emphasize the importance of becoming, not just looking the part. It feels good to look nice, 
to smell good. But it's more important to be nice and be good. This is very, very important. We don't want to be a people who are just worrying about an outward appearance that is not accompanied with an inward reality. This is very important. And in Ramadan, the biggest lesson we learn in Ramadan is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran when he said, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Perhaps you would attain taqwa, attain the rank of piety. In other words, if I explain that in simpler terms, be Muslim. Become inwardly and outwardly. That is the reality of a taqwa. And that's what fasting was prescribed in us so that we could have a taqwa. And a taqwa is an inward state that is manifest on the outward. Very important. Sheikh Samir would say to us often, Hafidhullah Ta'ala, he says, don't come to me with your mask. I hate mask. I need you to take that mask off and show me who you are so you can become who you need to be. Allahu Akbar. He would say, don't come to me with your mask. Put your mask on. He said, I hate mask. I need you to take that mask off and come to me as you are so I can help you become who you need to be. Th that's a lesson we took from him, right? And in the news and in several places, especially in the black community, which we are greatly concerned about, we dress the part, and that's a good thing. And we came together outwardly. That's a good thing. But because some of us have not embodied the reality of the outward appearance and have substance inside, what is inside manifests on the outside and we have some of the disturbing, sad incidents occur that we all have become too familiar with beginning to expect it. To the point, the non-Muslims are making mockery of our false outward appearance. I wanna share something to show you how bad it is. I had a family member tell me about what they saw on Facebook, non-Muslim. And the person was talking to his wife because he saw this outward appearance. And the wife said to him, oh, they just dressing up. All of them going to go back to normal as soon as the Eid is over. That's what the woman said. She's Because her husband was like, wow, this is nice. They're really, and she said, oh, they're just dressing up. They're going to go back to normal after the Eid. That's, 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 they just celebrating. After the celebration, they're going to go back to normal. So all the kimars are going to come off. All the thobes are going to come off. 
and they're going to be back to normal, just like us. This was not, and I'm not exaggerating. This was a non-Muslim. The woman said that to her husband and her husband conveyed it to me because he asked me about it. And I said, that's why we're always pushing education so stuff like that can't be said. Another non-Muslim, he's a bar owner, a club owner in the Newark, New Jersey area. He put out at the Eid, and he was making mockery. He said, Eid special, $5 shots, real shots at his bar, club bar, club slash bar. Eat special, $5 shots, real shots. He actually put that out there. And though that sound like a joke, his wife said, and that night, some people will be at his club getting those shots. So what I'm mentioning is because we are a people that have lost substance and we ourselves need to return to a people of substance, not just the parents. So what I would say when we look at these challenging times we find ourselves in, that we start talking about being people of substance rather than just people of appearance. And that becomes our reality. We are a people of substance. Islam means something. So I got a video of an incident at one of the Eids. And the person was video recording. He sent the video to me. And as he was walking, he said some profanities and he said, these people don't care nothing about Islam or they have no respect for Islam. He was talking about Muslims. And I was thinking to myself as I was watching the video and everybody running and, you know, he sent the video directly to me. I thought to myself, is it they don't have no respect for Islam because we are people of no substance? And there's nothing to respect. Is, is that why they would come to our sacred lands, our sacred places, our sacred gatherings and disrespect it? Is it because they see in us that we don't even respect our stuff? That's just something to think about because that's what came to my mind. Have we lost our substance to the extent that even our youth no longer respect what we do or hold that as sacred? That's a question that we should ask ourselves. It's easy to shift the blame. It's easy to say, these young guys have lost their minds. The kufar they against Islam. But do we ever look inwardly and say, what are we doing as Muslims? Are we making an environment that calls for respect? Are we worshiping and practicing and embodying the deen in a way that demands respect? This is inward questions we should ask ourselves, right? And 
as I look at the joy, to this Ramadan for me was the best Ramadan that I've had in years. And it's close to me saying the best Ramadan I had in my life. That's why you didn't see me much. I was really, really, really enjoying the beautiful Ramadan that we had here at Masjid Muhammad in Alang City. It was phenomenal. And I thought something. I was supposed to lead the Eid where that incident occurred. I was supposed to be the khatib for that. When they invited me for that, I said, that would be nice, but I actually have my own community here in Atlantic City and I have to stay home. It would be like, it wouldn't be just to my community if I went to another community as an imam and as a khatib for the Eid and deprive my community of their own imam. So I had to kindly decline. But I was thinking to myself, man, what if you were there? Right? Could you have said something on that minbar that might have inspired some of those young people so they wouldn't do something like that? I, I thought about that. That's hindsight, of course. Could I have been there and said something, you know, real talk, and maybe impacted the heart of one of those young people and they wouldn't act in that way? I'm not saying because you can't go back and change the future, but it's pondering things. You can learn from things and you can reflect and see, you know, how can you have benefited? Or what can you do in the future? Right? I, I think about that stuff all the time. So what I say is we have to become people of substance. We have to start looking how to be real believers. How to be Muslims inwardly and outwardly. No one's perfect. No one's expected to be perfect. But we all strive well, we all should strive for perfection. And this is a long opening for me, but it was good. I guess we got it started. But don't go anywhere because why we're having this session is really not what we're talking about. This is just preparing the table for a real discussion we need to have. And we're gonna to try to approach it in the best way because what we gotta address is a response to the incident that is serious error and blunder. And we can't allow people to take that blunder and we be quiet. So I'm going to stop here. I have much more uh, to talk about. And I'm going to give it to Imam Naeem. But please, please, please share this video. Okay, you know, you press your like and all of that. But share this video. Because I want this message to go out faster than the blunder that went out. And that blunder is a serious blunder. And if people follow it, it's going to be a catastrophe. So we have to address it, right? And that's why we talk about substance over appearance too. So I'm going to pass the... the the, the mic, as they say, to our great and beloved Imam Naeem Abdullah. But please share this because we're going to hit something that is extremely important.
and it cannot be uh, it cannot be ignored. It's it's haram to ignore the subject we're going to talk about, and probably worse than haram when you have the ability. Barakallahu bikum. Imam Naeem, the mic is yours. <clears throat> Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma ba'd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Everyone, I have a question for you all. All of you who are with us now, live. I have one question for you all before I proceed. Did you share this video? If I go to your timeline right now, will I see it? Will I see this video in your timeline? That's a question. Please answer in the comments. Did you share it yet? Usually, if you see me looking down in the beginning of our broadcasts, normally I'm looking at my phone. And what I'm doing is I'm sharing. Alhamdulillah. Y'all share. Good. Alhamdulillah. Subhanallah. I really think this subtitle is appropriate. And I didn't have any uh, input into the subtitle, but it really captures the meaning of what we are trying to convey. And really, it captures my theme at our community here in Pittsburgh, what I've been trying to convey as it relates to different issues all month. Hey, Iman Fahim, wa alaikum salam. Check the inbox. Substance over appearance. That's a very deep sickness that a lot of us have as a people, collectively. Even outside of Islam, many times we are overly concerned with how things look rather than how they really are. As long as they look a certain way, it doesn't matter that the reality is different long as it just looks that way. We have that problem as a people, not just Muslims. I'll give you a few examples. You know, Ramadan comes and Ramadan goes and you have to have a conversation about moon sighting because that's how you determine when Ramadan actually starts and when Ramadan actually ends. Not only Ramadan, but just all Islamic months. Most people don't like to hear that subject. They trivialize it and call it moon sighting war. They don't care when Ramadan actually starts. They just want to fast what everyone else is fasting. It don't matter how or if it starts, if it's based upon some bogus calculation somewhere, or if it's based on a country who's pretending to do moon sighting, but they're doing calculations as well. It doesn't matter. Long as it appears that we're doing it at the same time, then that's cool. It doesn't matter if Ramadan's not even in yet. We care too much about the appearance and not the substance. Another point that I brought out a lot and bring out a lot every Ramadan is iftar, the fast breaking meal. You know, the fast breaking meal, you know, it's sunnah. It's highly recommended, in other words, 
to hasten to break your fast as soon as the sun sets, when the Maghreb prayer is in. If you've been listening to me teach and talk for well over a decade, you know for me directly that if you follow these calculated prayer schedules and uh, apps, that the time for Maghrib is too early. At best, is going your adhan is going to go off six minutes early. And as Muslims, we're hastening to break our fast. So it's highly probable that you're going to break your fast too early. Maghrib is not going to be in yet. You would be surprised of how many Muslims, even after you explain it to them in detail, and you speak slow, or you break it down for the people in the back, so many Muslims still don't care. Because they only care about the appearance. We even had some guests at our masjid during Ramadan. Uh, a jama'ah. And this was explained to them. It's been hard enough for our own local community to ex uh, to uh, accept and understand because we so like to go with the crowd so much, right? You talk about this, you demonstrate it, you show in real time, people will still have the app on and they, when, when, it think, when that app goes off, they don't care if they can look out the window and actually see the sun, they're going to eat. So it's hard enough to get our people to get away from that, but we had a visiting guest community in our community. And it was explained to them, yo, don't do this. And they did it again anyway. So you got half of the community eating dates and the other half waiting. That 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 Jamaat war out there welcome, they're not welcomed anymore. That was their last time there. People don't actually care that Asr is still in. And it's not time to break fast. It's all about appearance. We had during Ramadan, and I wasn't doing any classes, any lives at all. But the situation got so bad. I had to do a three-part live, three-part course about halal food. Because, you know, we're in the masjids. We're gathered there for iftar. Masjid al-Mukmin, alhamdulillah, we have a tradition where we do iftar every single night of the month of Ramadan. And traditionally, it's been potluck. For those of you who don't know what potluck is, is everybody volunteers and they bring something to make a meal. So the way we would do it in Masjid Mukman, we would have a calendar and somebody would say, okay, I'm preparing the food for this particular day of Ramadan. And they buy the food, they prepare the food, they bring the food. Somebody else may say, well, I'm not going to make the food, but I will sponsor or not, I'll pay for it. So we'll take the money and give it to someone else to prepare the food. The Muslim basic knowledge of what is haram and what is halal with regards to food is so low and dismal that we had to cancel potluck in the middle of Ramadan and made intentions that next, next Ramadan, it is no potluck, it's all catered. Because people constantly bring haram food into the masjid. And they're not doing it to be evil or sinister. They have good intentions. They just don't know what haram is when it comes to food. And they're not going to classes to learn what haram food is or what haram food isn't. So... Uh, when a Muslim comes to the masjid, they should be protected from ingesting haram, at least at the masjid. 
So we said we have to cancel that. And then next Ramadan, there's no potluck, there's no calendar going out. It's all catered. The most we may do is put a calendar up to let you know what you what type of food you might be getting that night. And by the way, you know, alhamdulillah, we're not like Imam I mean, we know Briani and stuff. We didn't have Briani one night at Master Mokman. Almost every night was soul food. And if not West African food. May Allah have mercy on Masjid Mu'min who deprived the people of biryani. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. That's right. We had macaroni and cheese. One night we even had cornbread. Cornbread from scratch. You want your cornbread? I, I can, did you have corn, real corn in that cornbread? You got to ask the chef. I'm assuming so. I don't know. Did you taste it? I don't know it was good, though. I don't know. My taste buds ain't sensitive like that. I just know it tastes good. I, I don't know. Someone did that here. I was like, hey, hey, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I'm just messing. Man, it was nice. We had macaroni and cheese. We had, you know, our stuff. And, you know, our, at least our people here appreciate that. I remember years ago, uh, a lot of the food was coming from the main halal spot over there. Did you know that Medi Mediterranean type food? Now I remember brothers voiced it. Brothers like, come on, man, I'm tired of this rice and all these kebabs and, and, and stuff, man. We need some food here, man, some soul food. <laughs> and that's good, too, because a lot of people, a lot of times you'll be surprised. There are a lot of people in America that think Mediterranean or subcontinent food is Islamic food. And it's actually like haram or makru to eat like macaroni and cheese or fried chicken or something. They, that, that's, that's not Muslim food. That's cool for our food. Right? <laughs> Just a quick oh, pause for our sponsors. <laughs> b, b strawberry cornbread is by far among the best cornbread that you could ever taste. You must come to Master Muhammad first to get your uh, your taste buds uh, in a state of joy. That is brought to you by b, &B Strawberry Cornbread. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Samira might have something to say about that. We, we got to taste it and find out. <laughs> Allah like So, but, you know, substance over appearance believe it or not a lot of us too many of us not all of us but too many of us actually don't care about if we eating halal or not as long as it appears to be halal alhamdulillah in our local community here and i've mentioned it more than once uh I, I noticed over the years, like when we have Tarawi, you know, obviously our little small community is a black community. All the black folks come for iftar, right? They come, they might not even come in time for the congregational Maghrib time, but they're in time, they're there in time for the food though. So they come, they eat the food, they, they may even hang around for some small talk. But you start getting prepared for Isha. Start calling their done for Isha. Years ago, you would see most of the black folks scatter almost like roaches. Like you cut on a light. You got a roach infested in the kitchen. And you come in the kitchen in the middle of the night and cut on a light. And you see people scattered. It was almost like that during Ramadan's after iftar, before Isha, and barely any black people would stay for Tarawi. A second crew would come in for Tarawi prayer, the night prayers, and they were mostly non-black. I noticed this years ago. So the black folks come for the food, and the non-black folks come for the Tarawi. And I spoke about this many times. This Ramadan was different at Masjid Mukman, or Alhamdulillah. Some nights, less people came for the iftar and more people came for the tarawih. 
I was pleasant, pleasantly surprised. I felt in the, in the context of Salatu Tarawi, I'm starting to see more substance over the appearance. I'm reflecting, but really, my Ramadan, like just like you, I think is this is my best Ramadan. For many different reasons. Allahu Akbar. One of those reasons, Alhamdulillah, my son was leading all of Tarawih. We had Hufaz come before to our masjid to lead Tarawih. Sometimes they would be holding a little Quran, right? Reading, even though they memorize Quran, maybe it's a little rusty, whatever, but they're holding a little mushaf themselves, reading it. Alhamdulillah, he didn't do that. Of course, my other son, Uthman, was in the back holding the mushaf, like to uh, put him back on track when he came off track, but he didn't need to hold it himself. He didn't need to read. Alhamdulillah. And so, that was beautiful. And I really felt like, you know, Imam Amin talks about this a lot. Sometimes you feel like, you know, if you're not there, something's going to go wrong. You know, you got to be there. After I saw this, I was like, I really don't need to be here. Right? I can go do something else. It was, it was a very good feeling. So we had Obviously, you know, uh, you know, we do 20 rakats here. We rate, we read a page each rakat, so you complete a juice in the 20 rakats. Uh, so we had a khatum, a ceiling, on the last night, and alhamdulillah, I did something that's common every place else, but not too common in America, right? We made it rain. Now, let me ask you a question. In an American context, when somebody say they're going to make it rain, what are they talking about? In American context, what does that mean? When somebody says, oh, we was over here and we was making it rain. What are they talking about normally? Be honest. Yeah, we know for loose, throwing money, but like, where do they make it rain in America? Where, where, is this common, where, it commonly, where it's commonly used to? In America, if somebody says, they were someplace and they made it rain. Where do you think they're about? Where, where do you think they're at? Malika said a stripper about to get paid. The Sunni cream the clubs. Exactly. Strip clubs and all that kind of stuff. I found out a while ago that this is from our culture. They just took it and converted it to something evil. Where you throwing money on naked women. You know, and Many Muslim cultures that I know about, while well, speaking particularly in the African context, if a person finishes memorizing the Quran at the ceremony, they may make it rain on it. If there's a gathering, and like many times they gather and they uh, maybe go talk about the seerah of the Prophet, وسلم, like a maulid, and somebody's giving it, they're really dropping it, they may make it rain on the speaker, they may make it rain on the one who is like doing nasheeds or, you know, kasidas honoring the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They may make it rain in that context, right? So in Islam, in a Muslim context, you know, making it rain on somebody is good. It's not something to be embarrassed about, not something that only happens in the most decrepit of places. This is a thing that's, that's is, 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 is powerful. So we take it our culture back of making it rain. So we, we made it rain in Master Book. Alhamdulillah. So it was not raining in the strip clubs. It was raining in the masjid. And a lot of times, you know, these people have taken the soul and the culture out of our deen. So it's just dry and it's, you know, it's just boring. Our stuff got soul and it got life to it. If we would have had a duff at Masjid Bookman, we would have started beating that duff. Duff like the Islamic drum. 
and we wouldn't care who said Bida Kufa or Shirk. We'd have been beating that drum. If we would have had someone that did 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 nice nasheeds or whatever, we'd have had him doing it. But you just had me and my terrible voice saying Takbir Allah Akbar. We had to settle for that. Because these are the things that are important. We focus on the food and the iftar and all that kind of stuff. But the real secret of Ramadan and getting the best out of Ramadan is that attachment with the Quran and praying at night. And so this is what we should be celebrating. This is what we did celebrate. Well, alhamdulillah. And so, you know, alhamdulillah, my, my, my campaign with Ramadan and everything else is, you know, really, really to bring the substance back into this fourth pillar of Islam that we all are practicing and not just dealing with the appearance and just looking like we're doing something but not doing anything. Alhamdulillah. So I'll pass it back to you, Yvette. Uh, so I just quickly, because I, I don't want to get too late because uh, this is a special edition and we need to address the real important issue. But if I talk about while our Ramadan for me was one of the best. For me, I got to see the fruit of 15 years of hard work in Masjid Muhammad. Because during Ramadan, two of my students who I raised came back to Masjid Muhammad and did a complete session all day, eight hours of hadith, narration, and explanation. And we completed two books and some parts of another book with ijazah given by all three of us. Those who started as students and they've become teachers in their own right with their own chains of narration and it was packed. And our students sat for eight hours learning, memorizing books of hadith and terms of uh, sciences of Hadith and actually receive from our own that were raised here and taught here at Masjid Muhammad and traveled abroad, did their studies, learned with teachers and returned back to this Masjid in this month and gave back to the community. So it's like kind of, and these were, these were young men who were raised in my home. So for me, it was like, a daddy moment and even brought me to tears. I was actually crying out of joy for this event. And that was a beginning. And Sheikh Abdulaziz, who's an Azhar graduate, who I remember came to America as a teenager, not knowing much, and now he's a learned teacher and sheikh and Azhari with chains of narration. And this is what we produced by the permission of Allah wa ta'ala. And a hafiz. So he's led Tarawi here, but he came back, he led all of the Tarawi. And yet he was teaching and he was functioning as the leader, which allowed me to go out and do that fundraising thing that I usually wouldn't have to do if I was here. And we accomplished all of our fundraising goals like because I had him here that really, and he was teaching Arabic classes, Quran lessons, just going, going, going. And to see after Tarawi students sitting there learning Arabic at Fajr, learning Arabic, individuals coming, reading books all Ramadan. It, it blew me away. Like this was this was like a dream 
that was happening in Masjid Mom. And that's why I wasn't on. We were like, we were busy, right? I didn't come on much, a couple times through the whole month. It was a madrasa here going on. The whole Ramadan, literally, I averaged two hours of sleep a day for the whole Ramadan. Maybe a few days, I got three or four hours. But that was probably one or two or three days. Most of the days, I only had two hours of sleep. We would be in the masjid to 1 2 o'clock in the morning. All day. From Fajr time, there's teaching. And we was 2 o'clock in the morning, I get out of here. One thirty, Go home. You got Sahur. It was, we was going. It was rocking up in this place. And that's my goal as like, I want this to be a center of learning. And to see that manifesting and see I didn't have to carry all that weight because Sheikh was here doing his thing. And he understood the responsibility of getting it done. It, it really, really brought, like, I really, like, it was a joy. And then after he left, after completing the Quran, Another one of my students came who studied here, lived in this masjid, studied. He went abroad. He finished nine years of study and was in the mufti program. And now he's a mufti after nine years. And he returned back to Masjid Muhammad and led the Tarawi prayer and gave lectures and talks and preparing for more teaching to come after Ramadan. It was just like a happy daddy moment for me because I remember all these struggles and, and like Allah is sending me relief, teachers, teachers, and we still got more coming. And then I also received correspondence and conversations with my beloved son, Ibn Ali Miller, who's now in Tareem Hadramaut with his children and his wife, and they're getting it. And he sent me a message of, thank you, thank you, thank you. I finally got what you've been trying to teach us for years. It's in my mind. And all of that was just a part of like, Ramadan was so, so rewardable for me personally. Like, because sometimes we work and we don't see the fruits of our work and that can be tiresome. But when I looked at this Ramadan, it was like Allah said, keep working. Here's everything to show you. It's not, you're not wasting your time. Keep working, keep working. Here's, here's a picture of the fruit of your work. So for me, it, you know, and, and the last at the Eid, because I live in an area that's surrounded by those who oppose, oppose al sunnati wal jama'ah, meaning the Ash'aris and the Maturidis, and those who follow the four schools of thought, and Sufis. I live in an area where we, don't, we are surrounded by that ideology. And they're always, and they're multiplying in that. But Masjid Muhammad's Eid was bumper to bumper, packed, standing room only. Despite how many people try to undermine our efforts, Allah keeps showing us, keep going. Y'all on the right path. Y'all doing the work. Keep going. All those things really, 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 really give me strength, give me encouragement, right? And when I see the next generation stepping up of children, of teenagers working and wanting to learn and being committed and parents sacrificing their children. You go to the masjid, you help clean up, you go see what Imam Amin, you sit, whatever he needs, and we're getting it done. And I'm like, okay, here's the baton is getting ready to be passed. All of these things bring a joy in. And so for those who miss me all Ramadan, that's what I was doing was Ramadan. I wasn't taking a rest. I don't get no rest. I was still working, but I was working locally. And, and it was a beautiful feeling for me. May Allah be praised and glorified for his endowments upon us that are so many, the ones we count and the ones we don't even realize. But Imam Naeem, if we can, so we don't get too late, 
Can we switch to the very important subject? If you will uh, take it, you have the thing. And inshallah, unless you have something quickly before that, uh, but we want to get to that because it's very important. And we need all of you to pay close attention. Very uh, quickly. Attention. Very quickly. We also had another khatam of the 40 hadith. Mashallah. Mashallah. After, after every 12 rakats during Tarawi, I would read a hadith or two or three from it Mashallah. until we completed it. So uh, the night before the 29th night, the 28th night, we had a khatam of Arba'ina Nawawiya. And on the last night, the 29th night, we had uh, a khatam Quran, alhamdulillah. Allah Akbar. That's real quick. So, you know, it's important that we keep our, you know, SNE alive. You know, we learned it one time at the masjid. That don't mean you don't pick up the book again. You have to keep these things wet, wet and moist and keep going over it. Alhamdulillah. So we did that. We were able to do that during Ramadan, even though we weren't as lively and active as you were over there in Atlantic City, but all them classes popping off. But we, we trying to get there, though, inshallah. To shahid for all of us struggle and we will witness. So uh what the, the meat of what we're trying to get to tonight is first of all, I'm pretty sure all of you have uh heard or even experienced. I know some of you in, in here were actually there and uh in Philadelphia where there was uh, an intense shooting at the E. Not some non-Muslims shooting at Muslims. Muslims shooting at Muslims at the E in Philadelphia at uh, uh, the Philadelphia Masjid, Sister Clara Muhammad. You had something. You had you had a incident in Atlantic City too. You mentioned right. Yeah, they they had some they had some they had some fighting and stuff there as well. I even saw on uh, Instagram someone shared a TikTok video. Uh, what wh where is that? The Mall of America at? What city is that in? Minnesota. Minnesota. Uh, there was some some Muslims fighting or something at a mall or something there, right? And and so you have a lot of times you have people, many of us, who are Muslim in name or appearance, but the reality of being Muslim is not there. Yeah, they, they may be technically Muslims. The hukum may be that, yes, they are Islam, they're Muslim, right? But the essence of Islam it has not reached their, you know, their core yet. So a lot of times, you know, that's the only way you can have stuff like this happening, where uh, Muslims are attacking Muslims anywhere, but much less a Muslim gathering, much less a masjid, much less at, you know, one one of Islam's only uh, holidays, the Eid, with elders, women, and children i.e. civilians, people not involved in that street culture are also victims of uh, the street culture there. So so someone uh, uh, went public and said that they're not giving shahadas anymore unless people meet certain conditions. Someone said they're not going to give shahada. Somebody comes to them to take shahada, they're not giving them the shahada unless they meet certain conditions. He said he wants to take their number and email, et cetera, their address. And obviously this is geared towards young people. Want to reach out to their parents to ensure they are aware of this decision. The parents will be able to assist in informing the masjid whether or not this is gang related or not, or whether they have been studying Islam at home and are serious about their decisions. Uh, he has these numbers. 
uh, provide them with someone who can personally follow up with them to ensure they are sticking with the religion. To enroll them in daily, weekly classes. Provide them with a new Shahada certificate to assist with their burial rites as well as information needed when they want to make Hajj or Umrah. Log them into a master database. Make them agree to a contract that if they are found to be engaging in criminal activity, they will forfeit their right to attend the masjid and have their funeral arrangements made by said masjid. This person said, after listing those things, he said, if we want people to take Islam and Muslims seriously, we have to take Islam seriously. I am not giving any more shahadas unless this protocol is being followed. I've said it before. I am uncomfortable giving someone shahada without there being a system in place to ensure their growth and development as Muslims. They are liabilities to our traditions. And as far as I know, that was the end of the person's statement. Uh, I'm going to let Imam Amin take the deal. First, the first part that you, you want me to read the first part too. Yeah, that was that's the real the, the thing. Okay, so before all of which that I just read, I'm going to read what he said before that. He said, "Let me explain. During the time of the Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, people were known to take shahada for ulterior reasons, not related to being a, a sincere Muslim." Allah revealed an entire surah in the Quran that is titled Mumtahina, the women, the woman who is tested. This was specific to women who wanted to get away from their husbands. Man, man, you need to you need to back you need to back up for your mic. Something's back up? Going, yeah, something's going in and out. Go ahead. Hmm. Let me know how I sound. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, right. This was specific to women who wanted to get away from their husbands. And since there was no divorce in their religion, religious traditions, Islam was the only escape. So they came to the prophet professing a desire to take shahada, but not because they wanted to be Muslim. They knew Islam did not prevent, permit Muslim women from being with, with non-Muslim men. So if they took shahada, they would be, they would have be separated from their husbands. So Allah commanded the prophet to test them to see if they were taking their shahada to be sincere Muslims. History repeats itself, and those who do not know their Islamic history are doomed to repeat it. We need a system in place. When someone takes shahada, we need to do yeah, the following. Right the, uh, the one above that, PSA, you saw that? Oh, okay. That's the post. PSA, to all imams, students of knowledge, preachers, and teachers, stop giving these young people shahada until there is a system of checks and balances in place to ensure that they are taking shahada to be sincere Muslims, to not be, look, to be sincere Muslims, not to join a gang or to be cool. I'm going to say something and I'm going to read something because some of us as Sunnis, I'm going to start with us. We are parents, no substance. We appear to build knowledge and know nothing of the religion of Islam. I'm starting with us. Some of us are appearance and no substance. What do I mean? We appear that we know something of the deen, but we didn't learn, and the very basics of Islam is missing. Hence, we don't even make in car, we don't censor stuff that is obviously needed to be censored. This stuff is serious. This is not something that is light. This is our religion. This is our paradise. 
and the lack of understanding could lead to our hellfire. That judgment to follow that with all capital letters is haram. I'll repeat, that judgment that Imam Naeem just read, we don't care who said it. It doesn't matter who said it. That judgment with capital letters is haram. We advise anyone who hears that to ignore it as if it was never said. Do not follow that. I said it, it's haram with capital letters. And I'm going to let the scholars from the family of the Prophet وسلم, address it. And I will read to you the seriousness of such a judgment. There is a book in Arabic. It's called Miftahul Jannah. It's written by the great Imam, the descendant of the Prophet, Al Habib Ahmed Mashur Al Haddad. He is from the family of the Prophet وسلم, and one of the foremost scholars of the family of the Prophet in the Hadramount Valley in Saudi Arabia during his lifetime. Rahimahullah Ta'ala. He wrote this book about the key to the garden, the keys to paradise, and it's translated, key to the garden. And inshallah, I didn't know this issue would come up. This week, inshallah, we'll put this, because I've been holding it, this week I'll put this book on our platform, on our website, so you can Get it and read it yourself. This is a very important book. We were planning to do classes in it, so we hold the books for later. But now with this case, it needs to be out. And inshallah, let me read what he said. Could you read the PSA first again? So the context, please do not listen. I'm asking you, please, even if you know the speaker, don't mention this speaker's name. It's unimportant. We're talking about what was said. Because some of us, when we hear names, we get lost in the name and forget the content. We're talking about what was said, no matter who says it. That's all we're talking about. Is that clear for everyone? Please do not put the person's name. It's unimportant for what we're talking about. Because I know us, we like fitna. We don't want no fitna. We want to speak, teach the truth. The point we're talking about, the name is unimportant. Does everyone understand that? Because I want it to be clear, we're not interested in who said it. It don't make a difference. The statement is crazy and we can't accept it. No matter who says it. Is that clear? So don't put the person's name up. Don't do that. Just take the ruling. And this is not time to be childish. It's very important. Don't be childish. Don't put names to get fun and likes. Don't do that. We want to deal with the issue. So read that point again, Imam, please. PSA, to all Imams, students of knowledge, preachers and teachers, stop giving these young people shahada until there is a system of checks and balances in place to ensure that they are taking shahada to be sincere Muslims, not to join a gang or be cool. Okay. Here's the book. Niftahul Jannah, Key to the Garden. By the great Imam, Ahmed Mashur al-Haddad. He was one of the foremost scholars from the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He lived in... Saudi Arabia, originally from Hadramaut Valley in Yemen. This is the Imam. So it's not Imam Amin Muhammad. This is the descendants from the family of Imam al-Haddad. It's not me. 
it's the rule in the religion. But if I say it, you say Imam Amin said, no, here's the book. If Tahul Jannah, there's the author, that's his name. It's available in English. And it's sufficient to make the point. Key to the garden. Chapter 15. Chapter 15. The, test, the two testimonies are mandatory for entering Islam. I'm going to read what he said. The meaning of, so I have the original Arabic book here. And this is the translation. Chapter 15, page 37. Put in there, Imam, key to the garden, Ahmed Mashwar al Dahdad, chapter 15, page 37. So they know where it is at. You don't got to go looking. He said, chapter 15, please listen closely. Right? Chapter 15, the two testimonies are mandatory for entering Islam. Right? Here he goes. We have already mentioned that since belief in the two testimonies is essential in Islam, the two testimonies meaning Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadur Rasulullah. Right? Is essential in Islam someone who affirms the oneness of Allah but denies the message cannot be considered a Muslim. We should we shall now state that it is a condition for anyone wanting to enter Islam to utter the two testimonies together, beginning with the word ashhadu, I testify. This phrase implies certain knowledge, submission of the heart, and belief so true that it is as though the matter in which one sets this certainty and faith were actually visible, visible and tangible. One must say, ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah it is not sufficient to say la ilaha illallah without the words ashhadu and muhammad rasulullah he continues someone at whose hands a person becomes a muslim a muslim must teach him the two test testimonies or their equivalent in any other language in words which express their meaning and negate anything contrary to it Excuse me. This must be accompanied by a complete lack of hesitation and by the renunciation of every religion other than Islam. I'll repeat that. This must be accompanied, accompanied by a complete lack of hesitation and by the renunciation of every religion other than Islam. Listen closely now. When someone comes to him, Wanting to, wanting Islam. When someone comes to him, wanting Islam, he should make haste to teach him the two testimonies and should not delay. I'm going to repeat. When someone comes to him, wanting Islam, he should make haste to teach him the two testimonies and should not delay. Even if one is on the pulpit giving the Friday service sermon. He should come down, have the person say the two testimonies, and then return to the pulpit. He's on the mimbar in Jumu'ah. He's giving the khutbah, and someone comes and wants to take the shahada, and no one else gives it to him. He comes down from the khutbah, the mimbar, he gives the shahada, and then he goes back on the mimbar. For his sermon will not be invalidated by this. Whereas for him to delay, meaning delay what? Delay that person taking shahada, would mean that he is contented to see this person remain a disbeliever when he has already come in submission and to be content with disbelief it is itself disbelief. 
I'm going to repeat that. Whereas for him to delay, what? Delay giving that person the shahada would mean that he is contented to see this person remain a disbeliever. When he has already come in submission, he's coming to become a Muslim and to be content with disbelief is itself disbelief. This is not a light matter. It's not a light matter. Let me continue. After all, there is a risk that the man might happen to die before being taught the two testimonies of faith. That means he could die before uttering it. You telling him delay, this guy dies as a kafir. The only way he could become a Muslim is by uttering the testification of faith and to tell him, wait till we check you out. It's insane. Insane. That person may die as a disbeliever and he would be in hell forever because you delayed him. Let me continue what he was saying. That was my comments. Then he continues. Neither should anyone take any material reward for teaching the testimonies or for inviting people to Islam. For these are duties and the reward for them is with Allah. A man who receives such material remu 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 remuneration reward for that would be trading with his religion and will repel people from Islam, whereby he would be deprived of an abundant reward. The man at whose hand someone accepts Islam shall enter the garden. For the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, let me say this hadith, for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Man aslama ala yadayhi rajulun wajabat lahul jannah. Whoever Someone accepts Islam's at his hands, the paradise is obligatory for him. And in other words, the garden is, oblig is the obligatory reward of anyone at whose hands someone becomes a Muslim. It's not Imam Amin. And the most scariest line in this is right here. To me, I'll put it close. This line, which is right, move my hand here. I'll bring that closer. You see that line? I'll put my fingers between it. This is very difficult. Right between it, that line right there. It says, Warrida bil kufr, kufr. You see? That line, out of everything, to me, is the most scary thing. The one who accepts for someone to stay as a disbeliever itself is disbelief. And you would tell one of the things that I say at this masjid all the time when some people, and they do it, they come and they say, Imam, so-and-so want to take their shahada. I said, you delayed them till you came to me? What are you doing? Someone comes to you and want to become a Muslim, immediately say to them, say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If they don't know Arabic, tell them in English. There is no one deserving any worship except Allah and Muhammad is his messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. After that, then you talk, tell him all that other stuff. You don't delay shahada for one minute. When a person comes and wants to become a Muslim, you do not delay that. And as you saw, Habib Ahmed Mashhur al-Dad, he said, even if you're giving the Juma khutbah and someone wants to be a Muslim, 
you come down and you give him shahad and then go back and finish the khutbah. You don't delay. You don't say wait till after Juma, after Jumu'ah. How many people we see their Islam is held so they can have some big display in front of the whole community? It's haram. And because we don't learn the rules of the religion, we are coming up with some of the weirdest things that is just insane. Imam, that literally happened to me like a month ago or something like that. I walked in. I think I might have been late for the Juma as well. And someone said to me, someone's here to take Shahada, right? Like you say, you know, normally we wait after the Juma or whatever. I said, they're here right now? They didn't take Shahada? Where they at? Come on, right here. Repeat after me. And I gave him Shahada right then and there. People commented afterwards, it was like, like, wow, I never seen that before. A Shahada before a Juma. I said, yeah, it had been sinful for me to delay it any minute. I found out about it. He was right there, gave him Shahada. And then went and then went and started the cookbook. It didn't happen in the middle of the cookbook, but right, literally right before Juma, right before the dawn. I, I want this ruling, though. Like I said, we don't care who said it. This is serious because it can result to people dying on the state of kufr, on a state of disbelief. And Allah commands us in the Quran every Juma we hear it. Wala tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. And don't die unless you die as a Muslim. And you cannot become a Muslim except by uttering the testification of faith. And if you're going to an Imam or a student of knowledge or a community and you go there, wanting to become a Muslim and they delay your shahada because they want to see if you're trying to join a gang, this is insane. You are the shahada and then go do all that investigation. By all means, you don't delay no one's shahada, ever. Ever. Because what you may think, I'll remind you of the hadith of Sayyiduna Usama bin Zaid radiallahu ta'ala anhu when he was on the battlefield and he had a non-Muslim and he was getting ready to strike him with the sword and as he was getting ready to strike him that man said Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah and he killed him when it got back to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the Prophet said to him did you kill him after he had uttered the belief? And Osama said, he only said that to save himself from the sword. And the prophet repeated, you killed him and he uttered the testification of faith? You killed him? As if to tell him, did you cut open his heart? Do you know what was in his heart when he uttered that? And, and, and it is in the narration that he said, I wish he, it was like I was never born. That's how emphasized the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that. Where are we learning our Islam? When the very foundation of our deen, the very thing that is, the key to paradise, we're delaying it for our la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. Come on, we cannot be serious. And listen, for me, for the Black Imams Roundtable, this is risky business because we are so appearance with no substance that we can't even tell each other the truth anymore. But we are morally re responsible to clarify these. This is not even, this is like big, 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 big errors. This ain't something that you can walk away from. This ain't something that you can ignore. This is something 
that if the Muslims start following that, we might end up just all being non-Muslims, following some judgment like that. Because that is accepting that someone would remain in a state of kufr. Come on, we not that bad, are we? We haven't lost all substance, have we? I hope y'all understand this case. As I get, I repeat, let's not concentrate on who said it. That's unimportant. We don't want such a judgment to find its place in the hearts of Muslims. This is dangerous. And I would be more strict in speaking about it. It's unnecessary, though, for the purpose we need to serve. For the purpose we need to serve, I'm not going to go as in detail I would like to. Because what I really would like and what we really concerned with is that none of us do no mistake like that. Do y'all follow my point? I say this for real, if you never answered. Is this point clear? Is it clear? Please say yes. And if no, say it. Is this point extremely clear? Never delay no one shahada because what you think. Is this clear? Go ahead, Imam Naeem. I, I, I just wanted to clear this issue. Alhamdulillah. This reminds me, I don't know if this was like some universal prison thing, but I remember back when I was there, brothers used to ask, a new shahada, like three questions. They used to ask the person, are they doing this for protection? They used to have to ask the person if they owed anyone anything, like any prison debts, you know, gambling, New York, we used to call it juggling or whatever, or whatever, I forgot. Anyway, and they used to ask the person if they have any beefs, right? The intention behind all of that initially was that, okay, now you become Muslim, you are Muslim brother, we're going to take care of all that for you, right? We're going to take care of all of your, your prison problems for you, so you don't have to worry about anything. Sometimes when that tradition got to some prisons, some people misunderstood it and said, okay, if, if you got beef or you got, or you got debts we not going to give you shahada until you take care of that which is clearly wrong as imam amin said you do not delay anyone's shahada under any circumstances do not delay it you give them you give them their shahada and any other problems they have, they have, you deal with that after. Because, again, we have to stop thinking like disbelievers. The biggest crime, the biggest sin is kufr, right? So no matter what anybody else is doing, it's not more heinous than kufr, a disbelief. I mean, Muslims, we have to think like that. Because we are Muslims, at least if we have substance over appearance. You just want to look Muslim, but not really be Muslim at the core, then yeah. All of these other things are more important than disbelief itself. If you, if it's just about appearances, but no, we're Muslim. It's not about appearances. Appearances are secondary. The primary thing is that we have the proper belief that we have belief at all. And if we know someone has the belief, they they want to believe in what Muslims believe in, and they understand that, and they come to you to give them shahada, give them shahada. Don't care who says wait or delay or or put them through the ringer, or make sure they, you know, give them your fingerprints, or what, whatever they, whatever they talking about. And I want to answer uh, a couple of questions here. I put it in the private chat. What about I have a lesbian family member that want to want to take learn Islam? She a younger relative as well. What do I do if she says she want to take shahada for having given up back with? nature homosexual acts give a shahada and then tell her to stop those acts give a shahada and then 
in that order. Give her shahada and then tell her to stop doing that. She she want to become Muslim. She already knows that stuff is sinful, is not right. But if she says she believes in Allah, she believes in the messenger of the the messengership of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Give her shahada. As bad as homosexuality is, it's not worse than kufr. And a lot of people may be shocked to hear someone say that, right? But homosexuality is not worse than kufr. And I don't think a lot of us believe that. I think a lot of us in our core, we believe kufr is better than homosexuality. I mean, for real, for real. Or else, why would we get so much flack for trying to teach the proper belief? It's not important to so many people. The Aikido Wars, right? Belief ain't important. Homosexuality is more important to some of us. Our priorities are all jacked up. Kufr is bad. Homosexuality is bad. But Kufr is worse than homosexuality. Hussein said, a person who gives that type kind of ruling, would you say that it shows their lack of knowledge realistically? I will say, and I know Imam Amin has, a, has an answer to that as well, but I would say my time being Muslim, I've come across a lot of people. Some of them have titles, various titles. And what I've noticed is that some people, because they are so intelligent, they're smart. And then I'm not being sarcastic either. They are smart and they're intelligent. But because they're smart and intelligent or think they're smart and intelligent, they skip basic stuff. And they go to high level stuff right away. And they skip all the basic stuff and learning the basic stuff, the level one stuff with teachers. And so they miss a lot of the building blocks of their knowledge. And it's people like this who, no, nah, I didn't study that basic book. I didn't study that basic book either. I just went and studied straight with that book, this high, in, high level or intermediate level book. A lot of those people, they make mistakes like this. Because they don't have the foundation of building blocks. Because this is what we're talking right now. This is basic stuff here. And somebody that has a lot of knowledge should know that. But a lot of these people, a lot of them have different names, different titles. Some of them are well-known. Some of them are not. They miss these basic stuff because they're too smart for all of that in their mind. I want to say this, right, Imam Naeem? Mm -hmm. That's why we mention, don't talk about the person who uttered this. I mean, it's obvious that they're going to find, you're going to do what you're going to do. But that's not the issue. Right? I believe the intent is noble. I don't doubt that. What the person is intending, I believe is a noble thing. I don't have no doubt about that. I would not accuse. The idea is I want to do something good. I want to prevent people doing this type of stuff. I got it. I agree with you. That's just not the way to do it. Not only is it not the way to do it. Um, that not only is it not the way to do it. It's sinful to do that. Listen to my point. I understand what is intended. I agree with what is intended. However, the solution you came up with is unlawful, and whoever follows it is sinful. To go further, if the heart level is there, it will lead to disbelief as a ruling. As I mentioned that line, al-rida bil kufr, kufr. Being content with disbelief in itself is disbelief. That's, that's serious. I didn't say it. I didn't make it up. That's the rule in the religion. It's mentioned for a reason. And so when I say 
realistically, a lot of people have not studied the sacred law. Reading Quran and Hadith, Hadith, books, without studying the sacred law well is insufficient. It doesn't work. You're going to interpret the Quran and Hadith improperly. Not because you're a bad person. It's because you don't understand the sacred law. There's a big difference. Listen, are y'all ready? I want y'all all to copy and paste what I'm getting ready to tell you. Legal rulings are not taken from the Quran and the Hadith books. Legal rulings are taken from thick books. Do y'all got that? I'm going to repeat it with some of the fast typers. Type it up. Legal rulings are not taken from the Quran and Hadith books. Rather, legal rulings are taken from thick books. Do y'all got that? Can someone put it up so we can share it? Because our job is to educate ourselves. And this is a problem. Legal rulings are not taken from Quran and Hadith books. Rather, legal rulings are taken from thick books. Could everyone copy and paste that, please? Could everyone copy and paste that? It's extremely important. We're trying, we want to save people from kufr. I don't want to want to become disbelievers because someone makes an unwise ruling. We don't want that to happen. We don't want to block people from Islam because of a popularity contest. Because someone got good intentions but making val invalid legal rulings. We don't want that to happen. So we have to speak. That's all we're talking about. We're not talking about nobody's personality. We're not talking about anything else besides this legal ruling that is given is not correct and it's dangerous. So we have to clarify. That's it. No more, no less. Right? But most of us don't realize this because we're slogan people. I follow Quran and Sunnah. Yeah, what thick books are you learning from? How are you understanding legal rulings? I follow Quran and Sunnah. Yeah, you're not qualified to extract legal rulings from Quran and Sunnah. I go to my previous question. What thick books are you ruling from? Oh, follow Quran and Sunnah. That is an error. And you see how bad that error can be? It could lead someone to stay into disbelief because of you misunderstanding Quran and Hadith. So this is an important issue. It's not something light. It's not a kitty game we can laugh about, ignore it, you know. No, 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 not this. This is going too far. This is worse than what happened at the Eid. This is worse than what happened. This is dangerous. This is dangerous. This is not something we sit back and say, hey, hey, hey. no, 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 no. This is too much. It's wrong. We're not going to criticize any individual. We're saying this can't stand as a legal ruling. We can't allow that. No. And that's why. And if we are mistaken, which we're not, because we're quoting the scholars, what they mentioned, you show me in any thick book, in any school, where they tell you to delay the Shahada. Show me one book of thick in the Hanafi school, Maliki school, Shafi school, Hanbali school. You show me one thick book that says delay the Shahada why you investigate if the person wants to really be a Muslim or not. You show me one thick book that says that. One, just one. I don't even need two. Show me one. One relied upon book of thick in any school that says that. This is, in, this is, this is going too far. We make mistakes. We human. But this is a huge mistake. It cannot be accepted. It cannot be. And maybe the root cause of this problem is this, taking legal rulings 
from Quran and the Sunnah and not reading books of fiqh. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe that's it. We got into this habit of interpreting the Quran and Sunnah ourselves, and now we made major mistakes. This is a problem. So keep this rule. Legal rulings are not taken from the Quran and Hadith books. Legal rulings are taken from pick books. That is a difference. So this is not something that's light. If you have any questions, because that's, this issue needs to be clear. If there's any questions further about this issue, I'm not interested in who said it. That's not important. Please emphasize. We're not talking about personalities. We're talking about the legal ruling in this case and this case only. We ain't talking about nothing else. Is it well understood? I, 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 Imam Naim, I don't mean to emphasize that, but you know us. We'll get distracted quickly. Nah, 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 nah. I want to talk about the issue only. Is that Islamically legally valid or is that an error? I don't want to talk about who said it. Don't make a difference. We're talking about the legal ruling. That's it. Nothing else. Because I know this one is going to affect some people. Because now you got to deal with your personality infatuation over legal rulings. Because I like so-and-so. So-and-so is popular. I'm going to Forget about the legal ruling in the religion. And this is a mistake. We can't do that. Uh, so if any questions, please feel free. There's a question. Imam Naeem, where is that at? Um, you put that in the box. Imam Naeem, where you get that question from? Uh, it was right. It was from Facebook. I'll read it. It says, Assalamu alaikum, 3453. I have a question. How does a new shahada tell her mother that she took her shahada, but afraid to because her mother converted back to Christianity after a failed Islamic marriage to an abuse husband. I guess you meant abusive. Yeah. That's case by case basis. And the person needs to see the details of it. Sometimes she may have to conceal that for her own safety. I, I don't know the situation or, you know, I mean, how severe it is. Right. But in general, in general, I'm not speaking about that specific case. If the person feared for their safety or for their life, it is recommended, it is permissible for them to conceal their shahada outwardly. They took it, they believe, but they don't make a public display because of the harm that they may not be able to bear, right? And this is known from the hadith of Ammar ibn Yasir, who his mother and father, Sumeya and Yasir, were among the first martyrs in Islam. But when they was torturing him, he said that he didn't, he said words of disbelief. And they went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and the Prophet asked him, was your heart firm in belief? When you said what you said, he said, yes. He said, if they do it again, you do the same thing. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us when you're in this condition this is permissible but if that person is not in that condition then maybe they will find a wise way to tell but if they feel that they're going to be harmed and it would be above what they could bear it is permissible islamically for them not to say it as for what's in their heart their heart is muslim a muslim but i don't want this issue I'm speaking in general. I don't know the specific case because there may be details. But as a specific case, what I'm saying in general, that's the legal ruling. As for the details, then you need to know about the details. And then the answer may change based on the details. And Allah knows best.
So we good, Imam. We covered the issue well. Is everyone okay and clear? We've done our responsibility. Yeah, I think we fulfilled our obligation. At least in my opinion. So this is a Facebook question. Assalamualaikum. Since a kid, a lot of Jumu'ah leaders or Imams delay the Shahada until after the Jumu'ah. Why is that wrong? Just so I have an understanding. What is wrong is when you delay the Shahada, that means that person is going to remain a non-Muslim until they get the Shahada. And it's not permissible to delay. Why? Because that person may die. And they didn't utter the testification of faith. And the only way to become a Muslim is to utter the testification of faith. If you delay that and they die, they still didn't become a Muslim. And you've let them die in a state of kufr, in a state of disbelief. That's what's wrong with you. We had a real situation here, Samira will remember, several years ago. A brother was uh, attending to marry a, a non-Muslim. The sisters got with, the Muslim sisters got with this woman that this brother was going to marry and after their conversation with her he or she was ready to take shahada the brother went and talked her out of the shahada and married her you can't make this stuff up a brother about to marry his sister Talked her out of the Shahada. SubhanAllah. Uh, anyway, mashallah. Is that person to blame if that happens? Meaning delaying the Shahada and they die. You are sinful. Whether they died or not, delaying the Shahada is sinful. And if you accept that they, so this is out of ignorance. Most people do it because they don't know the rules, which is a problem. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, Talib al -ilmi ala kulli Muslim. Seeking the knowledge of the religion is an obligation for every Muslim. You need to learn. If you don't learn, you're going to make these kind of mistakes. Thinking is the right thing to do. So that's another case. But here, you still didn't change the condition of the person. That person died on a state of kufr. And you were the reason why. Do you want to go to Allah like that? You block someone for becoming a Muslim because of your suspicions, your thoughts. You told them you can't become a Muslim because I ain't sure you really know want to be a Muslim. Men enter. Who are you? Who are you to be the hakim on the ikhlas of someone who wants to become a Muslim? What is this? Who are you to be the judge on the sincerity of intention of someone who wants to become a Muslim? What is this? <laughs> and we're going to leave that to every imam or student of knowledge to their discretion who comes to Islam and when. Huh? What kind of religion is this? Uh, come on. We can't be serious. But we are. Or we wouldn't be having this conversation. We really reached that level. That now we've become judges on determine when someone is ready to become a Muslim from our side? Are you serious? If you want to hear who died and left you, boss, that's where that needs to be applied. Who died and left you, boss? Who died and left you the ruler and judge over the intentions of someone who wants to become a Muslim? Come on. We ain't lost our Islam that bad, did we? We're not that really. Come on. No. No, 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 no. 
It's sad, but we reached this point. It's true. If I told my teachers this, they would say, <laughs> my teachers, if they heard this judgment, oh my goodness. I wouldn't even tell them. <laughs> I wouldn't even say it. SubhanAllah. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. We are living some serious times. And guess what? Before we did this live, people were saying, Imam, don't say nothing. Don't say nothing. So you want me to be sinful too? <laughs> I know better and you want me to be quiet. Don't say nothing. Let's let people fall into possible kufr. Don't say anything. Question. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi imams. E Mubarak to you two brotherly gifts to me. Backbiting. It's something that weighed on my mind and how much I started to keep silent a lot during Ramadan. What are the components of what makes backbiting what our beloved says it is? I want to stay away from things that cause it. Backbiting is, while well, like, to the library captain, uh, first and foremost, backbiting is saying about someone in their absence what they wouldn't be pleased of. And I use the word saying, but also like even by indications as well. Something negative about someone. Oh, go ahead, Imam Naim, you finish? I'm finished. And backbiting, though unlawful to speak about someone in a way, there are exceptions to that. There are exceptions. Among them is if there is a wrong that needs to be corrected, and the only way it can be corrected is to mention the person. That's permissible. Or there is an injustice, and the only way to clear that injustice, like you're going to court, someone did a crime, you can mention that person by name, right? To remove that injustice. These are exceptions as Imam an mentioned when he talked about this subject. Imam an in his books, he mentioned this issue. When are the exceptions that backbiting becomes permissible? Because to talk about someone in a way they don't like is backbiting even if it's true. But when is the exception to that? These, he mentioned these cases, right? So in this case, it's not necessary to mention the person's name. So we don't mention his name. Why do we need to mention his name? The point we're trying to fix. Did we fix the point? Yes. So we don't have to mention his name. No need. There's no need to mention the name. To mention his name unnecessary would be unlawful backbiting. If we can establish the point and we fix the point, no need. We fix the point, no need to mention the name. Not important. Other exceptions to the rule is, for example, when someone wants to marry someone and there may be some uh, negative about them that the prospective future uh, husband or wife may need to know it's permissible to say what that thing is and restrict your backbiting just to that which that's what, what, that which is relative to that and the same thing with uh with business transactions actually that happened to me uh several weeks ago someone called me and they were thinking about going into business with someone else right and they asked me I gave him a long pause and I told him that this person is known 
for hustling people out of their money. And I said, if you didn't ask me about that, I wouldn't have told you about it. So my advice, don't get in the business with it. And I, that was it. I know some other dirt about them too, but it had nothing to do with the business, right? So I just told them that what had to do with business. That's it. Does Shahada have to be in Arabic? No. In any language, that brings the meaning. It's better to be in Arabic and recommend it. But if the person doesn't know Arabic and they don't pronounce it correctly, then you tell them in the language they understand. Whatever conveys that meaning, as Al-Habib Ahmed Mashwar Al-Haddad mentioned. Does that go for same thing for not being not tell a Wahhabi masjid one attends that one is an Ashari? Does the ruling of concealing one's iman faith would relate to the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? We crazy man. <laughs> That's, it's not the same stuff, right? Is this because? A, let me, this cannot be fair, cannot be fair. Listen, Wahhabi doesn't always equate to Kafir. And even in our talk, so don't understand that. So don't, a name doesn't solve issues. Cause you could go to a person that you think is Wahhabi and he don't even know what a Wahhabi is, but you do. He don't even know he's a Wahhabi. So he don't know nothing about what you're talking about. So Ashari Wahhabi has nothing to do with what we're talking about, right? In terms of rules. So if they're going to beat you up and kill you because you say you're Ashari, then maybe it would be wise that you don't even go there, right? Let alone tell them. But that's not the case, right? I got your point, but it's not, it's not the same. So, no, the rulings are two different things. One, we're talking about Iman and Kufr, and another one, you're talking about different groups. These are two different issues. They don't mean the same thing. Right? I think it's important to note, related to this question, because somebody, someplace else, I don't remember, but it was very recent. Someone asked me, uh, it didn't relate to Wahhabis, or it related to, like, Shia, Shi. And I had to explain to them that there are many different groups of Shiites. Not all of them have the same beliefs. And even if a particular individual was in a particular group or branch of uh, the Shiite or of the Shiites, in Islam, there's no like blanket or group talk fair or Islam. Like if an Islamic judge was trying to establish if this person was Muslim or not, he wouldn't make that judgment based solely on the fact that he belonged to a certain group. He would question that person with regards to the tenets or aspects of his faith. So just because, oh, he's part of this group, that group believes this. So that means that the ruling of that group applies to that individual. It doesn't work that way. The Islamic judge will ask that individual, regardless of what group they claim to belong to. That's extremely important. A lot of us think that because we are belong, we belong to this group or that group, that the ruling of that group automatically applies to everyone who ascribes himself to that group. When that individual may not even know what the beliefs of that group are. So an Islamic judge would question the individual. He would not judge them based upon the group that he belonged to. So that's, an, I just wanted to mention that. It's extremely important. Can we back by historical figures by mentioning bad things they did? It depends. What's your purpose? If you're clarifying an issue, religious ruling, and they need to be mentioned for the clarification of the ruling, it's permissible. If you're just doing it unnecessarily, it's not permissible. Simple. Is there a ruling, a religious ruling that needs to be clarified. So for instance, we mentioned a historic figure that made an error religiously that people are following and we need to clarify that issue and it's only known through that person, then we would mention him because of the issue. That's permissible. But to go into other things, it's not permissible. Simple. So it depends what you're doing.
Imams also asked the question from picking up, staying away from useless talk throughout the days of Ramadan and how cleansing it felt. I thought of how backbiting starts off a lot from useless talk a lot of times. Uh, I agree with you because the useless talk, like I hate useless small talk, right? It's like a waste of time. But alhamdulillah. But here, keep the point that we're making. And you should learn a lesson from what we said. Only mention people when it's necessary for clarifying the legal ruling. If the legal ruling is clear, you don't need to mention no one. And you shouldn't do it. That's why when we talked about this issue, we know exactly who said it. But it would be a greater confusion to start off mentioning the person and not the issue. Because then people would think it's about the person and it has nothing to do with the person. The person, in fact, may have great intentions and really want to do good. We're talking about the legal ruling. That's all we're talking about. Nothing more, nothing less. You follow the point here? And even though we may disagree with the person on other issues, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about this issue. And we don't want no one to make a mistake in this issue. So we're going to talk about this issue. That's it. Y'all follow? It, it's, that's it. Now we're talking about the issue. We ain't talking about nothing else. The issue. Is this issue the valid way to do it? No. Why? Bing, 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 bing. That's it. It's not personal. Has nothing to do with it. Has the issue. This issue is dangerous. So we're talking about it. That's it. We don't want no one to fall in it. Because he who does not know evil will likely fall into it. And what's the use of having teachers that know the religious rulings and because a personality makes an error, we won't say anything. I don't know what kind of teacher that is, right? No, you fix the issue. Y'all got y'all got the point? Okay, Imam, we're done. Any closing remarks? One more. That, uh, there's this that marriage thing. <clears throat> yeah, come on. <laughs> I was just gonna say that. All right, go ahead, take it. Somebody asked, like, is a new shahada that's strong with Islam? How much time do I give her as to uh, marriage? There's no, there's no way we can answer that. There's, there's no cookie cutter, and there's no cookie cutter response to though that type of question. I can give you examples from the Sira where the Prophet ﷺ himself married new shahadas, but you know, you know, a lot of times we we put conditions on stuff. So it's a case by case situation. I don't think that. I don't even think somebody should even try to give you an answer on that. Every situation is different. And can I say this? The point that led to that judgment, I totally agree with it. The point that what the objective of that judgment, I agree with the objective. We need to make sure people in this Islam and they get it right and they ain't doing some other stuff. I agree. No doubt. We need to help our youth. We need to protect our youth. We need to protect our masajid. We need to protect our children. We need to protect our events. I agree. But telling people to wait to become Muslim to we verify you is not the way to do it. Do y'all got that? That's all. In fact, to do that is sinful. That's the point. That's it. Nothing more, nothing less. I agree with you saying. That's true. We need to solve this problem we got going on. That's just not the way to do it. In fact, that's worse than the problem itself. That ruling is worse than the problem itself. That's it. You follow my point? That's it. And because it was made publicly, and people may take it publicly, and I don't know when somebody's going to want to become a Muslim. And if we start doing that, man, there'd be a lot of people that's going to be denied Islam. Every young guy who need Islam, come and you're going to determine if his intentions is sincere. Man, that's a disaster waiting to happen. We can't do that. 
Where's the, where's the, <laughs> subhanAllah. The practicality of a lot of those points weren't even there, but that's not even, those. this whole issue of delay in the Shahada even trumps how many of the things that were mentioned are not even practical. Listen to this. This is the point. That's a woman, and she ain't trying to hurt nobody. Look what somebody told her. That's my point. <laughs> I was told that I needed to completely understand the Quran and how to pray before taking the Shahada. That's totally against Islam. What are you talking about? Let me give you an example. A man came on the battlefield to the Prophet ﷺ. He walked up to the Prophet. They was in the battlefield. He said, I want to fight or should I brace Islam and then fight? The Prophet ﷺ said, embrace Islam and then fight. He said, Ashadu an la ilaha Allah, Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. He went right on the battlefield and he was killed. Never made salat, never paid zakat, never read the Quran, never did none of that. He died immediately after taking the shahada. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned that his deeds are little and his reward is great. Amila Khalil. So how did we get from the prophet telling them? So the prophet said, wait, you got to learn Quran. You got to pray. Then you, you know, then you can go fight. He said, utter the shahada, then go fight. And he was killed. He never made one salat, never read one page of the Quran. So how did we get to that? It doesn't make sense. And when I say that, that's being passed off as Islamic knowledge. And we just be quiet. And this is talking about the heart of the dean. You're talking about someone's salvation here. And we making reckless, reckless rulings like that. You only can get to paradise by uttering the shahada. And we making rulings like that. We're telling people not only. <laughs> Come on. I don't even know how to. I don't even know how this is a discussion. But it is. May Allah help us. We have to learn our religion. We have to learn our religion. And if I was to do a serious explanation of this case with the scholarly quotes, with the books, it would really look, you would say like, wow. This ain't no issue of controversy. This is something necessarily known to be of the religion. This ain't some complicated thick matter or some theological matter like Ilm al-Kalam. No, this is Islam at its very foundational basis. The very first thing you got to learn about Islam is this. Come on. And that's the only, you see, we're on it this late, right? This is, this is, this is going to cause us personal problems, right? But nah, we can't, we can't be quiet about that. Because the internet moves fast and some people get that. And if it ain't followed, that's why we said share, 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 share. Why? Because the internet moves fast. People get that and they start liking and going and spreading and teaching. You cannot do this. You have to say something. And I would suggest other imams and students of knowledge do the same. It's not enough because we got to reach everybody. And if we don't get this part right, I don't know. Right? No, ask your question, sister. We already in trouble. It's too late. Right now, it's like, we can't we can't hide now. And you're already in it. Great, Imam Naim. Question quickly to ponder on, not to cause debate or fitna. Are the pillars of Islam in divine order or in scholarly order? And if you don't practice all five pillars of Islam. What state of belief are you in if you don't practice them at all? 
the ruling here is do you believe they're obligatory when they when they apply to you? Because sometimes there's a rule and it's not applicable to you. So in relation to you, it's not an obligation, even though it's a general obligation in the religion. Example, if you don't have money, zakat's not obligatory for you. So you say, I don't have to pay zakat. What you mean by that is I don't meet the conditions for zakat to be obligatory on me. But if you mean that zakat in Islam is not obligatory, that's kufr. If you mean I'm on my exempt cycle, I don't have to pray. It's not an obligation on me. But you said salat's not an obligation on me. That's what you mean. That's nothing wrong with that's true. If you meant in general, salat is not an obligation to Islam, that's disbelief. So we're talking about rulings. And that, but you need to learn, this is important, so you know when a ruling is applicable, when something is not applicable, am I morally responsible, am I not morally responsible, are there exceptions or they're not exceptions. That only comes by learning your obligatory knowledge of the religion. If you don't learn the far line, the personal obligatory knowledge of the religion, you're going to make a lot of mistakes because you didn't learn your religion properly from a qualified, trustworthy teacher who learned from a qualified, trustworthy teacher in a way that you ensure you learn your deen. That's an obligation. The Prophet wasallam said, طَلِبُ الْعِلْمِ فَرِيدَةٌ عَلَى كُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ Seeking the knowledge is an obligation on every Muslim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, هَلْ يَسْتَوِ الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Those who know are not equal to those who don't know. We have to learn. There's a certain portion of the knowledge it's not permissible of to not know. Even in our community, where that becomes something that's normal, it's not acceptable. We have to learn our religion. We cannot be unlearned about our religion. That's not permissible. We have to learn. Are we scholars? No, we're talking about the foundations of the deen. We're not talking about scholarly stuff. We're talking about every morally responsible individual is supposed to know this. If they don't know it, they're sinful. And their sin is a major sin. It's a kabira. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about nothing advanced. And if we get to the point where the very basic things of Islam are questionable, we got a serious problem. Now, wonder people don't take us serious. <laughs> to answer the first part of your question, first you have to understand that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam speech is wahi, is revelation, right? So the, the part, first part of his, his or her question was that are the five pillars, are, are they in divine order? They were, were they placed in that order divinely or scholarly? So they would be divinely because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam speech is revelation. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned these five pillars in that order in the Hadith of Jibril. The Hadith famously known as the Hadith of Jibril. I was told that if you die uncovered, it technically means you're out of the folds of Islam and will not be getting. You will not be grant, granted gender. People just be making stuff up. I think it's when people... Funny. I don't mean to laugh, but I'm just like, this is why we say we have to learn. This stuff is ridiculous. Yeah. This, you can't make this stuff up. But these are true statements that people are being told. Like, and all of it is microwave Islam. No one wants to sit down, read a book with a qualified teacher to an end, learn a subject. Like, we're all internet, get a little here, a little here. That's not how you learn Islam. That don't mean you can't learn some stuff, but you're going to be all over the place. You need to sit down, learn with a teacher. Teacher need to teach you a text. You need to finish it. You need to have some basic knowledge of the religion. That's it. That's how you learn. You don't learn by... Just question and answer. You don't learn your religion like that. You're going to learn some things, but a lot of things are going to be hidden from you. Do y'all follow my mean? You have to sit down and learn with a living teacher who learned. That's an obligation upon you. You cannot learn Islam on your own. You need a teacher. It's simple. I mean, even though it sounds complicated, but it's not. That's the religion. We have to learn. Uh, 
Alhamdulillah. I think that's all. Yeah. Okay. I mean, may Allah, and we just before, because we went long, and the issue is clear, though, right? We all got the issue. Just one more time, so I make sure we hit the point. Is the issue we talked about that you do not delay no one's shahada? When someone comes to you and wants to embrace Islam, embrace Islam, immediately you instruct them with the testification of faith. This is an obligation and it's not permissible to delay. Is is this this issue is clear for everyone? We got almost a hundred people listening and above. Can we get a hundred people to make sure they say it's clear? So we can walk out safe knowing we did our job. Yes, you can give Shahada over the phone. And please, I ask all of you. Don't go into details if you can. Tell everyone you know that may be misunderstanding this, tell them don't delay nobody's shahada. If you learn how to send someone a shahada, don't take them, don't wait five minutes, don't wait three minutes. You don't need an imam for someone to take shahada. You don't need a student of knowledge for someone to take shahada. Taking shahada can be given by anyone who knows how to say the shahada. If you want to go into the details, then take them to an imam, take them a student of knowledge. That's secondary. But for to become a Muslim, please, 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 please. Don't delay that for nobody. You don't need, they don't need a bunch of witnesses. You don't need none of that. Someone comes and wants to be a Muslim, tell them immediate to become a Muslim. That's it. Do y'all follow my point? This is so important. It's basic stuff, but we must emphasize it. And when the response come, we'll give more details. I hope it's sufficient. But if the response come, we'll give more details. This one we can't let slide. We can't let this one slide. We let a lot of stuff go. But this one, no, we can't let that go. So if, if 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 it's not understood, we will come back with more. No problem. Uh, but hopefully it's understood and we can fix it. And this point is two different issues. One issue is uttering the shahada. The second issue is teaching people once they learn the shahada. Both of them are obligations. You may be able to do the first and not the second. So then you take them to someone, right? And you should look after them and check on them. You should do all that. And you should get them sitting down with a teacher to learn their religion immediately. And what is obligatory to them? They should learn it. You should teach it. If you can't, you should take them to someone who can. That's a separate issue than delaying their shahada. It's two different things. Because you can't do B, don't mean you leave off A. You do A, and then you go find someone who can do B. And you don't delay A because of the unavailability of B. It's two different things. We want you to die as a Muslim. Now, teaching you, that's another issue. They're two separate issues and don't, don't put them together because they're not together. Okay, so we, we out of here, Imam. Anything? Can you address the, uh, someone said, I, I thought you needed two witnesses. No, you don't need a witness. And if, I don't need to go into all these details, if someone wanted to know you were a Muslim, they wasn't aware you took Shahada, 
you can say the Shahada as a dhikr, and from that, they can understand that you became a Muslim. You can say the Shahada as a dhikr, not with the intention of embracing Islam when you already became a Muslim, not with the intention of embracing Islam. You're just uttering it as a dhikr, as some remembrance. The person from that will know that you became a Muslim. But you don't intend to embrace Islam twice. That's how you solve that issue. If you're worrying about someone knowing you a Muslim. Okay, so the issue is clear, mashallah. Here's a statement. You're talking to the wrong people and trying to hit a specific subject. The imams know or should know the environment of their congregation. It's the street culture within the masjid. Okay, that's cool. I, every black masjid has street stuff in their masjid. I'm black. He's black. We black. We know our masjids. What that got to do with the legal ruling? It's two different things. We have, let me tell you something. I had, I'm telling you me, I'm in the black community, right? I had somebody come in the masjid and drop a bag of dope right on the masjid floor at Jumu'ah. You heard what I said? Someone came in the masjid with a big bag of dope, dope, heroin and dropped it on the masjid rug. Am I gonna say now, because we have this issue of sinners and they know I have, they making these errors, that I'm gonna block people from Islam until we make sure no one does this, these sins? No, we're not going to do that. We're gonna say, don't bring drugs into the masjid. You know, if you gotta check your pockets, we're gonna address it. Listen, bro, we're going to do all that. But we're never going to tell nobody, don't embrace Islam until you get yourself together. We're not going to do that. Or till we believe you're sincere. We're not going to do that. It's two different issues. So let's address all that stuff we got going in the masjid, right? Let's address it. But it has nothing to do with people becoming a Muslim. Do you understand the point? It's two different issues. Don't mix the issues. All right, we got to go. Let me answer this last question quickly. Hold on, Imam. Is it mandatory a Muslim child when the age of morally responsibility to take their shahada on their own? Yes, it's obligatory. But they don't take the shahada with the intention of bracing Islam. They take the shahada with the intention of fulfilling an obligation. So there's a different rule because they are judged as a Muslim based on their parents. But however, when they become pubescent, it's an obligation for them to utter with the testification of faith at least once in their lifetime with the intention of what? Fulfilling the obligation, not to embrace Islam. It's two different things. I'm talking about the rule. Do you follow that rule? Kareem, we're talking about the rule. We just have to learn, that's it. I mean, really, because we keep trying to have microwave Islam. We have to sit down and learn. Right? We have to learn the religion. I'm talking about the rules of the religion. I'm not talking about how we feel. I figured that this brother, Rasul Salam, he was getting at something different. He said there was a sh just a shooting at an E. We know, that's what we talk about. Is is that not important? It is important. But we're talking about a response to the shooting at the Eve, which was worse 
than the shooting at the Eve. Maybe I saw him comment way earlier. Maybe he left or wasn't listening or whatever. Or maybe perhaps he was listening to the whole thing and he thinks that the uh, the call to delay people from taking Shahada perhaps maybe is better or not as important as the shooting itself. Our contention, our whole point here is delaying anyone from taking Shahada staying on kufr is worse than the shooting itself as horrific as the shooting was that's our point that's being so he got it he got the point he just he took it he, he wasn't here to hear the whole discussion okay so he got the point he said no i don't agree with the delay that's he got the point that's all we're talking about yeah that, that's all we was talking about nothing else nothing more and stick there. Don't let nobody gaslight you to go somewhere else. We're only talking about this issue. We're not talking about nothing else. Anything else is not what we're talking about. We're only talking about this issue. And, and true hearts, this is another problem. We talked about this problem too. So don't tr truth hurt hearts. Follow the point. Again, but it goes to what the Quran and Sunnah said. If we identify a person from what we see and what they can be proven, we have to call them who they are. If they are hypocrites or disbelievers, the Quran and Sunnah answer this question. This is an a, 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 a amazing misunderstanding of the Quran and the Sunnah, right? I'm not taking it personal. Listen. You can't say who's a hypocrite. You can't. You can say who has the characteristics of a hypocrite, but you can't say who's a hypocrite. That's two different things. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned characteristics of a hypocrite. He doesn't say you, 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 you are a hypocrite. That's why they were hypocrites in Medina. He didn't tell nobody who they were. And the one companion who he gave that information to, Sayyiduna Hulayfa, he wouldn't tell nobody. So the Prophet ﷺ didn't walk around saying who's a hypocrite. And they were in Medina. Right? He didn't do that. He said the signs of a hypocrite. Right? So you're talking about a different issue. And all I say to that is legal rulings. You should go find one book of fiqh, because that's a judgment. Because if you say someone's a hypocrite, you call them a kafir. A hypocrite is a kafir, right? A true hypocrite is a kafir. So that's a judgment of tech fear on somebody. You cannot do that based on signs. Because the hypocrite that is outside of Islam is the one who does not believe in Islam, but outwardly acts like they do. That's a heart issue. From where do you get into someone's heart? How? It's impossible. He may just be a, 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 a I mean, really, how do you get? Because outwardly the hypocrite acts like he's a Muslim. He declares with his tongue what is not in his heart. How do you know what's in someone's heart? That's why we go by the apparent. If you say you're a Muslim, you're a Muslim. That's it. We don't go into your heart. Easy question. If I'm a Muslim and I'm a blood, you are a Muslim who, if you do what the bloods do, is sinful things, and you are a sinful Muslim. And if you believe that doing haram is lawful, you're no longer a Muslim. But if you're a sinful Muslim, you're a sinful Muslim that need to repent. That doesn't negate your Islam because you're in the bloods. Sinful if you're doing those actions. If you're doing haram things and you, you need to repent. But that doesn't mean you're not a Muslim. That means you're a sinful Muslim. And you should repent from your sins. It has nothing to do with your Islam. I'm talking about legal rulings. That's it. We need to teach these things because we don't know our Islam. Right? It's important. 
I hope y'all understand our point. We can't keep yeah. going on and on. We have to stop at one point. Exactly. But, but it's it's really the solution to all this is to sit down and learn. That's it. And while our conversation was restricted to the ruling that was given tonight, we agree with all of you that the issue of the violence has to be addressed. And I lived in Philadelphia for five years. And so that's not a long time, but it's long enough to understand what's going on. And so I always looked at Philadelphia as an outsider. And without even knowing the players involved, I can almost guarantee you that one or more of those kids that's involved in that, they came, well, most of them probably came from Muslim households. I, I highly doubt if any of those kids like like took Shahada and then started doing this. Of course, there's some, but you got to understand being Muslim or taking Shahada is deeply ingrained in Philadelphia. It's been said decades ago that there's no household that doesn't have a Muslim in it about Philadelphia. So there, there there's like Philadelphia has a deep, rich history. And, you know. It, when it comes to African Americans, at least, right? Uh, th there, there's no city like it. When it comes to Islam, what you see, what you see amongst the Muslims in Philadelphia who are pr pr uh, predominantly Black African American, you see in other cities where there's large concentration of Muslims from other countries. When you see their kids grow up and you see the stuff that they do, it's similar to Philadelphia. Philadelphia has a, a has a street culture, and it came into it, it came into Islam through many ways, and in a lot of in a lot of ways, even in a street criminal hierarchy, you can you can only get so far unless you become Muslim. That's how deep it is there. So if you're not from Philly, you're not going to understand that Philly is a different city. Different but type of city. I don't want, like, keep in mind, though, Imam, and I say to the people, this ain't about Philadelphia. Black communities have this problem everywhere. In our community, we have stuff. We be struggling with stuff. This ain't about Philadelphia. And nor is the incident in Philadelphia what we're talking about, really. We're talking about a legal ruling. That's what I'm concerned about. Right. No one disagrees with us getting ourselves together. No one disagrees with that. But when you're talking about the solution, how we get together is by blocking people from coming into Islam and delaying their Islam. This is a problem. That's all we're talking about. Yeah. Right. It ain't about Philadelphia. That's not the issue. Because Philadelphia ain't no different from New York and Jersey in terms of issues. Right. People don't just have issues in Philly. They got issues everywhere. Yeah. All we're talking about is the legal ruling you gave yeah. and how dangerous that legal ruling is. And it's not correct. And we need to fix it to make sure that doesn't become a normalized thing. It's, it's worse than the original problem. That's it. All right. We said that's it about 90 times and we got to go. May Allah reward you all. And please share this video. Share it. Share it again. We don't want people blocking people from becoming Muslim. That's our case. That's it. Please, 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 please help us in that. Right. Barakallahu bikum. Sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum.